to the Kimberly Cloud Show. I have a very, very special guest with a very exclusive story to talk about. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself to the world? Yes, thank you for having me on. Um, my name is Charles Smith. I'm an author. I uh, work with ARC, um, which is Aware Recovery Care, and I'm glad to be here and share my story. And I wanted to go into the beginning of your story that we, we discussed. It's so funny because it says, Mr. Smith's story starts off with being the best dressed little kid in town. I love that. You write some good books. When I read this, I couldn't even take my eyes off of it, nor like my whole face. I was just like mesmerized by the tragedy and I wasn't mesmerized in a good way, but in a bad way, because I was like, man, this guy done been through so much. Can you go ahead and explain to the world, based on your biography, what's done happened, beginning with your beginning, however you want to Being the best dressed kid in town? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I live in Worcester. I was born in... Born in Western Massachusetts, and my father owned um, multiple nursing homes in this area, and he owned um, a lot of land. And one day he lost it all. Nobody knows how he lost it all, but um, I was like four or five at the time. And when I was six years old, my uh, mother passed away of um, addiction and overdose. I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Thinking about her a lot during Mother's Day. But um, yeah, I, uh, after my father died, my, my father took me and my sister out to like places like Van Horn, Texas. Um, so y'all went around traveling a lot from Massachusetts. Yeah. Yep, yep. One of my memoirs from that time is called 10 Homes in 11 Years because I actually lived oh, in 10 wow. homes in 11 years. Yeah, yep, yep. And then, um, yeah, we, we lived in a Navajo reservation where my father got a job as a chef and as you can imagine i was uh um a kid probably seven or eight and i was the only white child on the reservation so i was treated as a minority i was treated um as you know a lesser as a person, I got into a lot of fights. Um, I eventually was made a blood brother of the Navajo by- Tell me about what they did to you. They um, they they coaxed me like I was gonna be, uh, you know, a friend. And I was in some of the department. They held me down and they, they cut me and I had to ch trade blood like a blood brother. I had to trade blood with the Navajo. Um, I totally forget. Is that, that an Indian now. person now? Is that yeah. an Indian race? Okay. Yep, yep, yep. And um, yeah, I that happened. And then I was always taunted by them, like that I um, that I was going to become a skinwalker. And what a skinwalker is, is it's a Navajo um, folklore creature that he, the thing can run up to 60 miles an hour, wears skins on its back of its victims. Um, it kind of looks like a werewolf, but it's got skin on its back. And it can change. And that's that's mythology, but it's really true in the area that you stayed in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I believe yeah. you. Yeah, they really <laughs> think that, that that is true. 
And one one day, I'll never forget this. I'll um, mm-hmm. I used to have a, a friend that was a horse, and me and my dog would go and visit the horse. Horse's name was Cinnamon. We would go visit Cinnamon a lot. One day, um, the uh, we were down there at the stable, and the kids started taunting me from nowhere. They just somehow knew I was over there. And then a storm came, and I really thought the skinwalker was, like, there. And because it was windy and it was storming and... You know, Can it, you tell me a positive event that occurred later, but continue, but I want to know after you finish, what positive event occurred that you can, that was a spiritual event? Because I know if you got these type of stories, you done seen some bad stories and you done had some good stories where you seen the spirituality and God himself visiting you through different parts of your life i would say yeah um jumping ahead to 18 years old i um i was at a place that i shouldn't have been and my father um my father came to me now keep in mind that he died when i was 11 years old my father came to me and told me that I shouldn't be at this place. That I I um just, you know, get out now. And I I ran, I ran out of that place as quick as I could. That was one time that um I understood that there was life after after uh, you know, death and loss and all that and um one time i i spent a lot of time really having a hard time believing in god especially after my father died you were telling me yeah yeah yeah. i think we all lost faith of god one time or twice in our life where it's like wow why are you doing this to just me god why is it that this family or this life have the perfect look like the perfect life and yet i am suffering so i see where you're saying you went atheist because so did i for a while Mm. yeah definitely i um i it was when i was um moving ahead again to like when i was 30 years old I I became a homeless veteran after my uncle and my grandfather passed away. They passed away a month apart, both due to cancer. And I attempted your to- Your uncle and your aunt? My uncle and my grandfather. Your grandfather. Yes. Oh, wow. Yep. That had to be- My tough. uncle, yeah. My uncle that raised me. So it was like losing- my dad everybody yeah my dad five years old your mother died 11 years old your dad died now when you're 30 your grandfather and your uncle died yeah yeah wow yeah back in 2000 so yeah at that time i became really depressed and i tried to end it tried to end my life because I just didn't want to go on anymore. I felt like I was God's guinea pig a lot of my life. You know, I just felt like, oh, he he can handle, let's see if he can handle this. Let's see if he can handle this. You know, and that's how I went through a lot of my life. And I, um, when my, when they died, and then I be, I became so depressed that I was carving on myself just to feel something other than what I was feeling. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. It was just such a dark time for me. I it was hard. So I um So yeah. you began to self mutilate and you decided when did you decide it? Well, when did you decide that you wanted change? Like when 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 was your turning point? 
after that, after my after my suicide attempt, my um, my friends that I lived with at the time they wanted me to go get help, so they sent me to the um, the hospital, and then I became a homeless veteran. I um, spent some time at the Brockton VA with, in their um, mental ward, their psych ward. And Understood. yeah, and then they sent me to Boston to live in a shelter. And that's when I really became, you know, I really opened my eyes because I've seen so many other veterans that were hurting at that time. And I realized that I wasn't alone. And that's one of the that's one of the turning points for a lot of people when they realize, hey, it's not just me. You Can know? I ask you something? Um, did that? the VA um, when when you went into and became a homeless veteran? Um, did the VA treat you like based on where you were at? East Coast VAs are pretty good. You know, you got your give and takes, but yeah, yeah. How were you treated there? I was treated good. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I I understood for the first time that I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And I had it since I was six years old. And all these all these traumatic experiences that happened to me compounded the PTSD. Because when you have PTSD, you don't just have like I was in a tank explosion. That's one PTSD. I was. You in, said in Guantanamo Bay, right? You were in a tank explosion, right? Well, that the tank explosion was in um, was in California, the National Training Center. But okay. then I, yeah, but then I spent time in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, too. Yeah, I spent six Can months. Tell- can you tell us about your events in Guantanamo Bay? Did you did you like did did anything occur? What, how was it? Because a lot of people don't know how Guantanamo Bay really is. Well, at the time we had um, Cubans and Haitians that were trying to get over to the U.S. and we couldn't just let them all come in illegally, so we had them in camps that we had set up in Guantanamo Bay. And then we were trying to transfer them into the U.S. or wherever they wanted to go. But a lot of Cubans and Haitians were really, um, they they died trying to get over to the U.S. Wow. Yeah. Like, picture the table in front of you, a coffee table or um kitchen table people tried to get over to the u.s in the ocean on nothing bigger than that i knew one kid he's he was probably my son's age now which is nine and he lost his entire family in the ocean by the time the navy found him he was all alone and he started out with everybody i am so glad they found him and i'm so hurt that he went through that yeah. Did you find him? Did y'all find him? Y'all team? No, the the um the Navy found him. Navy and the Coast Guard were looking for people, and they found him, and then they brought him to us. And yeah, it was just such a powerful moment. Yeah, a traumatic, traumatic moment. And you know that that really. Um, I still have a picture of the kid. He's a nine nine year old. Looks like nine nine ten. And I look at my son, and I, I look at that picture sometimes, and I'm like, yeah, my son is very lucky for where he is now. Yeah, because in in the city or the country, Ukraine is 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 really really hurting, and I'm so glad that that nine year old boy in um, Cuba or wherever he was, he sat up there and he was safe because in Ukraine he probably would have died. Yeah. You know? Yep, yep. My heart really goes out for the people in Ukraine. Me too. Yeah. 
And so yeah. you write you write books. Can you tell us a little bit about your books and what you've written? Well, I have a book on PTSD. Mm -hmm. I have a book on addiction recovery. I have a book on um, the first 11 years of my life, a memoir. Then I have a book on positive thinking and changing your life, acceptance of death, you know, accepting it instead of mourning for the rest of your life. You might, you might be here and they might be gone, but you need to still live the best life that you can for them. You know, and that, and that's one thing that really helped me out the most is, you know, knowing they're like my grandfather and my uncle and my mother and father, my aunt had died two years ago. My aunt, my cousin had, um, died of a heroin overdose, uh, five years, no, eight years ago now, somewhere around there, 2016. <sighs> You know, all, all, a lot all, of all, death in the family. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Ha, have you told the story in any of your books about that? Because when I read your story, it's 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 powerful. They found him. They found him de not decapitated, but he was decomposed. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. He he went missing on um, July twenty sixteen. And I'm a I'm a trained PI private investigator, and my other aunt had hired a private investigator, so the both of us were looking everywhere. Um, a hunter actually found his body on um, Christmas Eve of 2016, and well, his dog found him but the body was decomposed and they had to do dental recognition to identify the body. And he's the reason why I work in um, addiction recovery. And I, I work with uh, aware recovery care because the pain that we went through as a family because of that, I don't want, I don't want anyone else to witness. Do you have any other family that you can depend on right now that's in your family that's loving? Yes. Do you, I do. So you do have outlets. Good. You yes. have a good, yeah. strong net family. Yeah, um, I have friends, family. Yeah, I have a good I have a good support system myself. If you wanted to tell the world anything about your book, any of your books, just name one. What would you tell them? And how would you explain it in a term of encouragement? My addiction recovery book. I knew you were going to. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have um, I have stories of people that I know that have been in recovery for more than a year. That are and the stories are very uplifting, and it shows that. Recovery is real, and there is life after addiction. And plus, okay. my story in there too. And how <laughs> would you? <laughs> how would you? What advice would you have to give to them to encourage the world? Well, I, I always tell people. Um, I tried to take my life back in two thousand, two thousand one, or around that area. And now I have a nine-year-old son. You do the math. Now, if I tried to kill myself at that time and I succeeded, not only would I be not be here, but he wouldn't be here. And not only would he not be here, but you know, I, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I wouldn't be the author of seven going on eight books. I wouldn't be buying a house this year. There's so many things that can happen in your life after a traumatic experience. You, you know, and it as much as people, I've, I I know a lot of people that wanted to and have committed suicide. You know, I lost a lot of people to that, and. 
I, I like, wish I, I um, wish I could tell him that you know. Go ahead. When my um, thank you. When yeah. when my um mother passed away when I was fifteen, I immediately tried to kill myself by crashing on the highway in Charlotte, North Carolina, on Highway eighty five. But mm. something in me wouldn't let me crash, and I that was the beginning of um some history of trying to commit suicide but i have the key to it you have to notice the months of when you feel depressed and you have to fight it because it's certain months everybody has their own month like especially as the years go by and we get older we start to get insecure with ourselves or something happens a, a traumatic event but if we fight through it and we know that God is the ultimate goal, you know, despite everything we know, our family, whether dead or alive, if they love us, they're watching over us. They are watching over us. And just like you said, you've seen an event with your father, you know, where your father told you to leave that building, mm. you know. Um, well, it was actually a, a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a place called Spider Gates, and it's it was known. a bad place. Wasn't yeah, it? a very bad place. Yep, yep. You you kind of wanted to die, or you wanted something to happen to you, or you were looking for something to happen because you you were you know I can see because I can see that you probably been through so much where you put yourself in harm's way so many times just to see if something happened and nothing really happened. Because the angels were always watching over you. Hmm. I, I, if that makes I, any sense. It does. It does make a lot of sense. And, and then when that didn't work, you decided to start self-mutilating. And that was your way of being, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. I, I've done this. Everything. That's why your story is so powerful. Because everything you've done, I've done. And we kind of like stopped not at the same moment but i've stopped long time ago worrying about trying to commit suicide because i know that there's a upbringing and a better quality life transition that we have yeah i agree um yeah we a lot of people cut from the same cloth and you know it, it's what we do with our lives. Like I was telling somebody the other day that um, I feel like my time as a homeless veteran was my crucible. And to me, a crucible is an experience that changes your life. Yeah, you know, and that, that experience over all my other experiences was the one that changed my life because after that i i began to care about other people i, I began to change my life and dedicate my life to helping others and the funny thing is i i always cared about people it's just in my standpoint people have let me down not everyone but it's like I picked and I chose the wrong people to be around and hang around. And that cost me my sanity because I thought everybody was like that where everybody isn't like that, you know? Right. Yep. Yep. I mean, my, my cousin himself, I, and I've said this in, in, you know, in front of him before many times, but um, I say I idolized the wrong cousin. Because I idolized that cousin because he had all the girls. He had the big truck. He, he had man, money yeah. flowing out of his pockets. You know, he was a man. And his brother was the one that I should have been idolizing. Because he's, he's one of the best men that I've ever known. They both were. But he was on a straight and narrow, and his brother was not. And I, I went into the military because me and my cousin were doing um, cocaine at the time. And I, um, I, told, I came home one time and my aunt that raised me, 
told me, get out, get a job, and don't come back. And it was one of, some of the best advice I've ever had. <laughs> it was tough love, you, you know? And um, sometimes we need that. So I, I went out, and I got a job. I joined the military. You know, and I think about finding him. Finding him, if I didn't join the military when I did, that hunter and that dog would have probably found both of us. We're, wow. We're, yeah, because that's where I probably would have been right next to him. Because for the you see how God intervened. Yeah, yeah. The military. Yeah. To me, I'm gonna be honest. You have some good parts about the military and bad, but. The military as a whole, I believe that we, whoever serve or whoever is in the government, because they worship birds, are like technically angels. Just because you don't see wings, just because you don't hear, you know, the 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 symphony sounds, doesn't mean that we aren't angels in our own way spiritually. Because they, when we go to basic training, people don't understand. We had we either went through delayed entry. And if we didn't go through delay entry, we had to go to MEPS and they tested our ability, our strength. And we had to get an ear check. We had to get a knee check. We had to get everything to get clear. Some mm -hmm. people don't get clear. And the yeah. doctors are stubborn. They won't clear you. Oh, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. I I, I look at I look at my my life now and knowing that. I went through MEPS with PTSD, with PTSD. You know, I, I went through MEPS, um, you know, with, and maybe I shouldn't have, you know, maybe I shouldn't have qualified because of some of the things that I had going on, Me but, I did, but I did. And I think, it, I think it happened for a reason. I think I went in the military for a reason. And that was to, that was a part of changing my life. It's like being a military homeless veteran was the biggest part of changing my life. You know, it's funny. Um, I want to say this, like, where are you spiritually with God? Are, are, do you find, do, do you feel like you're a Christian or can you tell the world where do you feel like you're at in a standpoint of with God? It's funny because last weekend I was at a um, a first communion for my my niece, and my son was with me, and he's he asked me himself like, "What do you believe, Dad?" And I told him, "You know, I'm no one to say that no God is real or not real. I believe in them all." I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Christian God. I believe in Zeus, Apollo, um, the God, Wiccan God and Goddess. You name it. I don't have a reason to say that it don't it don't exist. I if, agree. Yeah, if somebody told me that they worship this camera in front of me, and that's what got them through the day, I'm not going to argue with that because to them, that's you know, the most important thing, you know, so why, why I, I have a pet peeve about, um, like people sometimes, oh, well, this God's not real because you should worship my God or this one, you know, who are we to say that one exists and one doesn't besides our belief system? But nobody should be saying anyone is not real. I don't think. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> it do. And, and, you know, if we had to go through anything and say, if you, if you had a chance, right, this is an off the wall subject because I'm not talking about the past, present, and future. I'm just talking about events in your life. If Elon Musk gave you a ticket to travel the omniverse and help save lives like one planet at a time through different galaxies the 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 um universe galaxy solar system whatever hmm. you know would you what would you do would you do it for one and how would you save the world 
one planet at a time. And then we're going to close. <laughs> wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. I would do it if my if my son could go with me because we're a package mm -hmm. deal. And um, I would do it by just trying to um, eradicate mental health, you know, eradicate like depression, anxiety, this and that. Just teach people mindfulness and positive thinking and all that. Because I, I think that a lot of the conflict that we have in the world develops from not maybe not like the governments, but like the active shooter here and there and everywhere. You know, there's a reason why. And a lot of that comes from mental disorders, mental health. You know, so if if I could get rid of all that, then I think the the world, the galaxies, the universe could be a better place. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And can you tell the people how they can reach you to your books and not only reach you to your books, but reach you, period? Lifelongexperience.net is my website. And it's got all the information. It's got my story. It's got... Um, information on all my books, interviews, your interview will be up there eventually when I, when I get it back. Um, yeah. So that's the best place to catch me is lifelong experience.net. You can write to me. My number's on there too. Yep. Well, I want to, um, totally thank you for taking the time out on a weekend on a weekend with your child. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Stay on the line. I will see y'all another time. Bye.